All right. I'm here with Lynn Alden. Lynn, welcome back to the show. I have no idea how many times this is almost like an Alec Baldwin SNL type thing going on here for Lynn Alden appearances on TIP, but welcome back. Always happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, this supply chain stuff is crazy. I posted something on Twitter uh, just a couple days ago. I think I had a thousand comments of people providing firsthand accounts of, and I mean, it wasn't like the same thing. It was like across the board, these impacts. Um, I know you've been talking about it for a while. So my first question is, is when did it start cu- popping up on your radar that maybe there's something a little off with the supply chains? Uh, well, certainly last year. I mean, that, I think most people were hit hard by, you know, seeing the, uh, like everything that was paper-based going away. So paper towels, toilet paper, all that kind of stuff just disappeared from shelves. And that's not a, that's not a very common experience uh, in the Western world or developed world more broadly. And so I think that got a lot of people's attention uh, where you can see that this could actually be disrupted. And then I was talking to people in the, in the, say the food industry and basically we're so specialized. So obviously we were still producing enough food but a lot of the supply chain is meant for delivering food to restaurants, uh, the, the containers it comes in, right? So like packaging milk in like a five gallon thing versus like a one gallon thing, for example. And you can't just, the machinery, you can't just quickly change to like one gallon. Uh, it's kind of, you know, countless examples like that. And when suddenly like nobody was eating in restaurants and everybody was going to grocery stores twice as often, that caused supply chain issues. Because suddenly you're, you're too short on those smaller package stuff and you have an overabundance of these bigger package stuff. And it's kind of a funny problem to have, but it's actually, it causes pretty significant issues. So those are, those are the first two, the paper products and then some of the food issues. Uh, but then o- over time, those have expanded to you know pretty much everything. Yeah. I have a friend that's in the contractor uh, building homes and things like that. And I mean, they went to, I mean, you just go back a few years and they're quoting homes and prices in advance of even building the house. Like it's going to cost this much. And now, I mean, they wouldn't dare list a price until it is absolutely finished. And I mean, in that particular space, they're waiting on windows for a house. Like they can't even close out the house. So, I mean, the, the one that you hear everyone talking about is the chip manufacturing with the cars. And I think it's got a lot of, of airtime, but I think when you look into the housing market, the concern that I'm starting to see is, um, it, are we going to see a, a giant dichotomy between new homes and pre-existing homes in, in the price point because of some of these implications? Well, we've seen to some extent with the, with the car market, right? So because new cars are postponed or productions are cut, uh, that elevates the price of used cars because that's kind of the market force at work. If someone has a spare car they're not really using uh, and someone need, really needs a car, uh, price goes up until the person who's not really using that car kind of wakes up and says, wait a second, I, I can sell this for twice what, it, what I should be able to sell it for. And so they, they sell to the person that needs it more or to a dealer and they kind of flip that. Um, and so that, that's the pricing function coming in. And so obviously we've been seeing that in housing markets as well. So, you know, obviously when, when new houses are cost more to price, that, that boosts up the price of existing homes as well. Because you say, well, I don't want to wait this many months. I don't want to, oh, that's going to be super expensive anyway. I'll just buy a house. Uh, that there already exists, and so every every does that and drives those those pr- uh, prices up as well. And I would describe that there's different there's different depths of how bad a supply chain issue is. And so, for example, the lumber spike was was well known because it, it spiked to like crazy levels, and then it came down at least most of the way almost as fast. And that that's actually an example of kind of a a shallow supply chain because we never had a timber shortage. Like we're not shorted on on big like chunks of wood. We were short on sawmill capacity, so we had an unusually big demand shift towards suburban and rural homes at a time when you know we only have so much sawmill capacity. And those operators are not dumb, so they're not, they're not going to put a ton of capex into a lot of new sawmill capacity when they don't perceive this as maybe lasting too long. So they'd rather just kind of accept the higher prices and enjoy that margin. Um, and so that's an example of a pretty shallow supply chain problem where it can, it can disappear almost as quickly as it appeared uh, once say higher prices kind of start taming that demand. Or if some, some of those operators do start to do some capex and expand that a little bit, but then there are other things like semiconductors that are a deeper supply chain issue because it's more global, right? So it's obviously a very high precision thing uh, to do high end semiconductors. Uh, A lot of them are in Taiwan or South Korea, for example, uh, and a handful of other countries. 
Um, and, and so a lot of semiconductor companies that you think of as semiconductor companies, like say NVIDIA, are fabulous. So they don't actually make it themselves. And so there's actually, there's fewer semiconductor companies than you'd, you'd think. And so for example, uh, we need memory, RAM, in, in pretty much every device we use. And literally three companies have something like 95% of the global market share. Two of them are South Korean, one of them is an American company. And they, they have almost the entire market share globally of RAM. And that's just one example. Uh, and so, and because in this, in this world of al- everything engineered is super complex. If you build a car with a thousand parts, if you're six things short of the car being finished, you're, you're out of luck. I mean, that car is going to get delayed. Now you can be creative and say, okay, we're going to ship this to the dealer and then send them the, the chips like in the mail a month later with instructions on how to install them for, you can get creative, but it, it starts to really mess things up. I mean, this is like a, it's like an exponential system essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, as people are hearing that they're probably saying, okay, so your example with the lumber sounds like it's just a flash in the pan. It's going to kind of work itself out. Um, as time marches on, but then when you transition into the semiconductor, it, it's something that's, that's a lot bigger. So, um, most people just want to hear that it's a simple solution. It's going to get better in six months or, or whatever. So how do you see this moving forward in six months from now? Are we still in a situation like we are today? Is it worse? Um, does it take a long time to sort itself out or is this thing over in a quarter from now? I think we could separate the structural issues from the the more rate of change kind of near term issues. And so the short answer I think is no one knows because obviously that's going to partially depend on, you know, is there like another round of the of the pandemic that shuts down more countries or makes them choose to shut down, right? So we obviously you have to predict things like that. Uh, then you have to predict other sort of fiscal decisions or or policies by different countries. So some of it is just inherently unknowable. But I think a, a framework to think about it is that you have near-term issues, like let's say China shuts down the third largest port in the world because of COVID fears or whatever. Obviously that, you know, that's gonna persist until that opens up and then kind of, you know, a, a period of time after that. that that's kind of- One a, COVID, one COVID case is what I was reading yeah, in the news. Is this accurate? I don't know. I don't know about that uh, specific <laughs> number, but yeah, who knows? They, they have like a zero code. They're one of the countries with like a zero code policy as they call it. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But so you have the, those those kind of specific instances like port X is shut down for time period Y, and then it's going to trickle after that for a period of time Z, and then it should eventually normalize. The The bigger issue is that we might have reached peak, peak globalization. And so if you take a step back for a second, you know, if you look back over 150 years of, of history, you know, it's generally been an, a period of, of glo- more, more globalization, which we can define as global trade as a percentage of global GDP. That's kind of the easy way. That's like the most, Mm -hmm. if you had to put it in one number, that's what it would be. And so up from the 1800s to the World War I, you had a period of globalization. And that was kind of the rise of America, the the manufacturing hub, right? That was kind of, we were the emerging market, essentially, that was kind of rising and and industrializing and, and kind of, you know, you know, making a lot of things for the world. We were, we became a creditor nation. Uh, so obviously the World War I period uh, disrupted globalization by a lot. And then after that, you had tariff wars, trade wars, that that was anti-globalization. Then you had World War II. And then after the, the whole, you know, after that ended and you had the rebuilding and you had the bread and wood system, you had this kind of reunification, we started another round of, of globalization. And we, we kind of paused in the, in the 80s, but then after the Soviet Union fell in the early 90s and China opened up in the 80s and, and early 90s, uh, we kind of had another leg up in globalization. Uh, and it was boosted by information technology and automation and offshoring and things like that. And so if you look at the United States, starting in the 70s with the, with the petrodollar system that a number of us have discussed a lot, like, you know, uh, I've discussed it, Luke, our, our friend Luke Roman's discussed it. Um, we, we, we offshored so much of our, especially the United States did this more so than other developed countries. But, you know, to some extent, all developed countries kind of outsource cheap things like a, like making a tire, for example, like a, a clothes or lo, like low value add things. But the United States went further and faster than many other developed countries where we hollowed out our industrial base to a much bigger degree than, say, Germany or Japan or, or, or even Italy, like a bunch of other countries that didn't really have that problem. And so we, we, we accelerated that more, more than others. So we, we totally disconnected labor productivity from wages. Uh, so wages kind of went flat in real terms and productivity kept increasing. 
because we arbitrage labor around the world, uh, at, you know, cheaper environmental standards, cheaper labor uh, in different countries. We can pollute over there instead of at home. Uh, and so there was kind of like this big arbitrage that helped keep costs down, but we sacrificed resiliency uh, and we kind of sacrificed in the United States, at least we sacrificed the blue collar labor force more so than most other developed countries. Um, and that, you know, global trade as a percentage of GDP reached a peak in around 2008. Uh, and so that was like 60% of global GDP, which is actually a really high number if you think about it, that global trade as a percentage of global GDP was like 60%. It's kind of an intuitively high number. Um, and so that has, you know, kind of flat line since then, flat to down. Uh, we're still in the upper mm -hmm. 50s. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't really, it's not like we just reverse globalization, but we have not continued to globalize really at the rate that we were. And that's due to a variety of factors. And so I think COVID was kind of a shock to that where we sacrificed so much resiliency to, ha to help keep costs down uh, more so than normal. Um, and so finally we got a shock to the system that tested the, the fact that we didn't have resiliency. Um, and so now we're starting to pay the price for how you know we, we've distributed this in such a complex way that there's so many ways for it to be disrupted either due to a pandemic or due to a, a, an overreaction to a pandemic in certain countries' cases, whatever, whatever the case may be small changes can ripple through the whole system and, and cause these cascading delays and shortages. You, you were talking about the globalization and the petrodollar system and specifically about the productivity versus the typical worker compensation and how that divergence. I think a lot of people that maybe spend time on Twitter see that chart get posted from time to time, where in 71, you see like this breakaway uh, between those two things. And people say, hey, what happened in 1971? And they're really implying that coming off the gold standard, kind of driving that. Is that a U.S. specific kind of chart? Or do you see a similar dynamic playing out on an inter international uh, level where these the compensation for labor did not keep up with the productivity of the on the chart that, that we so commonly share? That is, for the most part, a U.S. phenomenon. And so if hmm. you look at, at European wages, for example, yeah. uh, they've not had they've not really had the same problem. Uh, same for Japan. Now, you know, I, I don't have the charts in front of me. I would I mean, there's some percentage of it that is pure automation. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been everywhere. And like I said, I mean, you know, uh, even those net exporter countries like, say, Germany or Japan, they still outsource a lot of their cheaper things to, say, places like China or Bangladesh. Um, so there's there's still some of that. But this has more so been an American phenomenon. And it's, you know, if you go back to that, like 1971 chart, if you look at the trade deficit, it really kind of takes off at around 1974 or so, kind of the, a few years after that. And so that's, it's tied to 1971, but it's, it's really the system that came after it, which is the petrodollar system, where we started basically exporting dollars. Uh, and so that became our major export, which displaced our other goods. Essentially, we, we basically priced it so that our exports were no longer competitive uh, and, our, and our import strength was very strong. And so that benefited people that work in healthcare, technology, finance, government that didn't have their jobs exported, but then they got the benefits of that system. Whereas the, say the typical blue collar worker that say made cars, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, skilled, skilled worker, uh, you know, they got some benefits from the system, right? So they, they, their, their dollar, you know, maybe retained more strength than it would have but they sacrificed a ton for that as well. They either lost their job or their wages were severely depressed because you had your competition from other places. And then we really kicked it into high gear in the 90s with, with NAFTA. Uh, and then in the early 2000s by uh, you know, helping to get China into the World Trade Organization. And so we've had this, this cascading series of things that really you know, led the United States to have this big structural trade deficit in a way that many of our developed peers uh, don't have. And so we have a higher level of wealth concentration than virtually any other major developed country. Lynn, in your article that everybody needs to get out there and read, this article is phenomenal. Um, you talk about three key attributes that are contributing to the supply chain impacts that we're seeing right now. The first one you said was the COVID-19 lockdown. The next one was the consumer behavior change, and then uh, your money supply growth. Can you talk to us about each one of these and kind of how you see the importance of, of each one of them and, and how you would maybe weight them on the impacts that we're seeing right now? Sure. So, you know, if we look at, obviously we had periods of shutdowns uh, and then we have these kind of rolling periods of shutdowns. 
Uh, and so those, those present some just natural limitations on a system that, as we described, is, is pretty fragile. It's, pre it's global and it's fragile and it, there's lots of little things that can go wrong that delay things. Like we only have so many container ships, for example, and so you can have big bottlenecks and there's only, there's, only, there's key ports that if they're shut down, there's not a lot of, you know, workarounds. So there, there's that issue. Then the second issue would be that if you have a, if you have a rapid change in consumer preferences, uh, but you have industry that might take a few years to adjust to that, uh, then you can have a pretty significant bottleneck. And an example would be that if everybody wants suburban homes, they want to change the location at the same time, and you only have so much sawmill capacity, well, then you can have a, a spike in lumber prices. The same thing is if, if people you know, buy more electronic equipment than they would otherwise because they're stuck at home, uh, then and you only have so much semiconductor capacity, for example, well, now you have a problem. And those foundries are billions of dollars and take time to build and design. Uh, and so those are like specific examples of things, but there's like a whole bunch of changes that can happen. For example, if you if you can't take the the subway, if you look at say New York subway numbers, they're they're super low, and if people are driving more, um, or maybe they're not they're not driving as much because say they don't they're not going to nine to five job in physical form like they used to, but maybe more people need to drive sometimes, so they go and buy a used car, for example. Well, then suddenly you have a constraint in how much used cars there are at the same time as you have a constraint on new car production due to those semiconductor problems. So changing consumer behaviors against a system that can't just instantly adjust is another issue. And then two, I mean, three, if you look at periods of inflation, you know, people often say, well, we have inflation because we have supply chain problems or we have constraints in the system. But I mean, every inflationary period has constraints. That's what inflation is. So every, every inflationary decade we've had is money supply going up at a quicker pace than normal. So monetary inflation, combined with real world constraints that, that you know, you know if, if, if our entire world was software, for example, then if money supply went up, we probably would not see very big changes in price for software because it's, we don't really have a constraint there. But you know, in, in say the 1940s inflationary decade, you had shortages in, in, in commodities, you had shortages in labor, right? Because you, you had all these extra jobs out there fighting. Um, so that's why the, you had Rosie the Riveter come in and, and help build the planes and things like that, because you were you're starved for labor and the commodities. Uh, so in the 70s, uh, U.S. oil production peaked. Um, and so we were more reliant on imports at a, at a time when, you know, due to the, the due to the war ar around Israel, uh, we had those geopolitical issues where we were embargoed. Um, and so you had oil constraints at a time when uh, we also had just gone off the gold standard. Uh, we were increasing money supply at a fast rate. Uh, and so you had a real world constraint combined with money supply going up at a quick rate. And so what we see ever since 2020 is due to fiscal stimulus that is being monetized, we had a more rapid than normal increase in broad money supply um, while we have you know, changing consumer behaviors and real world constraints that are you know, making it so that essentially the, the fiscal stimulus kept demand elevated so people could still afford things uh, but those things, we didn't increase the amount of supply uh, of, of goods and services, or at least, at least certain types of goods and services. Um, and so that's where we started to run into these rolling issues where we have a lumber constraint, we have a semiconductor constraint. Uh, now, you know, you have, you have affordable housing issues. So there's, you know, rent prices are going up, for example. And wherever there's, there's periods of shortage combined with broad money going up, you're going to get, you know, periods of inflation or shortages, one or the other or both. So we like to talk about Bitcoin all the time. Do you see any of these uh, chip shortages impacting the mining industry and what that might mean for the price of Bitcoin? Because so much of it um, has to do with with mining the Bitcoins and um, just more hashing power coming online in order to drive the expense, the electrical expense of the entire protocol. How does How does any of that play into your calculus or how you're thinking about it? So that's been happening for a while. I mean, you know, you had obviously you, you had the that, that would go back to a changing consumer preference, right? Because of the Chinese mining ban, suddenly you had more demand elsewhere, but there are shipping constraints and stuff. So some of that, some of those older miners probably just won't make it over. They'll just kind of, you know, sit around until they're obsolete. So there's that issue. Uh, but then two, you had you know, even going back as far as say late 2020, you had semiconductor shortages that were impacting the miners and they're not exactly first in line to get you know taiwan semiconductor manufacturing to make their chips right so someone like apple's like first in line and you know bitcoin miners like number like 57 on the list i mean obviously i'm making numbers up but they're not they're not at the front of the line 
Um, and so, you know, you had semiconductor, I mean, you had a Bitcoin miner machine shortages, uh, which meant that hash rate did not go up as quickly as, as you'd expect from the price. Um, and so those who had the, the equipment were doing quite well in terms of margins. Um, and then, of course, we had the correction. We had the Chinese mining ban. And so for a period of time, it was, you know, that we had a somewhat of an easing in the, in the miner shortages, right? So their prices came down uh, of used miners. Uh, but we only have so much hosting facility, uh, you know, infrastructure around, you know, uh, basically uh, having them access to cheap electricity in a, in a safe and, and properly designed environment. You know, those, those, those are multi-million dollar facilities that take periods of time to, to get online. And so we kind of had one type of shortage into another type of shortage. Uh, and as an example, I mean, you know, uh, compass mining, uh, and I think they're doing great work over there. I mean, they, but they just had a South Carolina facility that was delayed. It was going to come online and it's not there. Like they partner with the facility operator. I don't know all the details, but they announced that essentially it didn't come on at the date they expected it to. And not, not to criticize them. I mean, they, they gave out credits to people who expected their machines to be online at a certain time. So that I think, I think they handled it as best they could, but that's an example of, of a real world constraint. And I don't know the reasons. I mean, they might've had, they might have had supply shortages due to some of these other other supply chain issues, or could it have just been you know a labor issue domestically? I don't I don't know the specific reason, uh, but you do have these kind of you know uh, periods of of facilities not being you know say fully online or fully present in time, and so it's been at somewhat of a premium. Now eventually that'll be fixed, but you know that's kind of the the real world constraint that we're going through, and that can keep hash rate from potentially going up as quickly as you'd expect from price. Although we still have had a pretty good recovery in hash rate. Hey, one of the things that you highlighted in your uh, write-up was this idea that we aren't seeing inflation like we are here in the United States in other parts of the world. Talk to us a little bit about that idea. So if you take a step back for a second, if you look over, say, the past 20 years, you know, the United States has grown its broad money supply at a little bit faster rate than Europe, uh, not by much. And both of them have grown their money supply at a much faster rate than Japan. So people often think Japan's printing a ton of money, but again, there, we, we talked about the, I think this in previous podcasts. There's a difference between base money and broad money, um, and so Japan's broad money is actually the, the slowest increasing in the world. Um, and so, if you rank those regions by, you know, inflation, the United States has had the most, Europe's had less than that, and Japan's had way less. Um, and so, basically, if you have two economies and they go through this pandemic, um, and one economy does not do fiscal stimulus. Um, they're going to have a reduction in demand for certain goods because some people are out of a job, people are, are you know tightening their belts more. And so there's a reduction in demand as well as the reduction in supply. And so you know you, you'll still have these certain areas of constraint that are are challenged, but on a broad sense, you probably want to have a lot of prices going up. On the other hand, if you have another economy where they have the same supply constraints due to the issue, but then they also print money and give it to people, then they're going to have demand go up to where, you know, back up to normal or even higher than normal, but supply is constrained. So they're going to have more inflation. And so, and people can debate whether that's good or bad. I mean, basically you'll, you'll get a faster rebound in nominal GDP and probably higher consumer sentiment, things like that. Um, but you'll also have more inflation, more constraints. And part of it comes down to the, the, the pre-existing condition. And so we talked before about how the United States has higher wealth concentration than most of the developed countries we have a higher rate of people that are paycheck to paycheck, which is, I think is, is played into the reason of why we did bigger fiscal stimulus than many other countries, because we had, say, a, a larger percentage of our population vulnerable to uh, not having a job for six months, for example. Um, so that, that was kind of the consequence of doing that. And I think that would, that would go down, that would go back to like the Ray Dalio long-term death cycle phenomenon, where, I mean, there were a lot of papers that predicted this would happen in the next downturn even though obviously they didn't uh, predict a pandemic. They're like, next next time we have a downturn, we're going to monetary policy three, as Dahlia would call it, where we're just going to hand out helicopter money, we're going to monetize it, and we're going to hold rates low, even if there's inflation. So it's kind of like we're walking through this playbook. It's almost it's almost eerie how much we followed that. And that's really because of a lot of the pre-existing conditions in the system. I mean, so as we fast forward into the next 12 months, um, I mean, have another sell-off or another downturn in the economy, I think it could totally happen. Um, so what does that lead to as far as the response goes? And, and you're seeing uh, central bankers, particularly here, the Fed in the US, signaling that they're going to tighten. And then Powell goes there and does his, 
his speech and kind of is like, yeah, maybe we won't, but, but everybody else is saying we are like, they're really throwing out a lot of mixed signals on, on their forward guidance. Um, and it almost appears like they know that they need to do it, but I think they're a little concerned that if they do start to do it, that they're going to really just cause they're going to wreak havoc in the market. So what are your thoughts on the forward guidance that we're having right now? And then the, the chances that that could actually be a mistake. And then what kind of response are we going to see next relative to the response we just saw through COVID? Yeah, so I really wouldn't want Powell's job here. I mean, he really doesn't want another pivot named after him, right? So like the the, the Powell pivot from, you know, uh, early 2019 after the big uh, quarter four 2018 sell-off where he tried to tighten. He tried he talked about how it was on autopilot. And then, you know, the, the stock market fell 20%. But more importantly, the junk bond market totally froze up for, for six weeks. Uh, just credit froze. Uh, and so that was kind of like the iceberg under this, you know, the full, that was the issue under the surface. Most, most retail were looking at the stock market Whereas like, you know, Powell was looking at the credit market most likely mm -hmm. uh, and, and panicking. Uh, and so he had to pivot and be like, no, no, we're, we're just kidding. We're not on all of autopilot. We're data dependent and we're not going to just, you know, ignore your signals. So he, he did the famous Powell pivot. And so I think the last thing he wants is to try to tighten into this. And so what we saw back then was if you looked at GDP growth rates, uh, it peaked around mid 2018 and started to decelerate. So we were not in a recession yet. We were not, we didn't have negative GDP growth, but we had decelerating positive growth. Mm -hmm. And so they were tightening into a decelerating economy, which yeah. opens up issues. And so actually we see kind of the same thing now where the economy in rate of change terms, GDP, you know, probably peaked in quarter two uh, of, of this year. You have the base effects and you have the stimulus and all that. Um, and so now we're decelerating in, in positive territory. There are some metrics like retail sales that are outright, you know, going down a little bit. Um, and they're going to they're going to potentially be be tightening into that. Now, it's a little bit different because back then, back in 2018, they were actually tightening. You know, they were doing quantitative tightening yeah. and raising yeah. rates. Now, it's more just like, do you want to be super dovish or hyper dovish? Right. <laughs> so it's it's they're getting less dovish rather than actually tightening which is a, uh, you're tightening rate of change terms, but you're still not actually tightening. So they have a, a higher chance of getting away with some of that because they've already, you know, all the, we're seeing so much reverse repo activity in the market. There's basically bank, banks are stuffed full of cash. Uh, other financial institutions are stuffed full of cash. There's collateral shortages in the treasury market in part because the, the Fed bought so many of them and also because the, the debt ceiling and the TGA drawdown so that the treasury has issued fewer treasuries than they otherwise plan to do by this point because they're constrained. Um, and so you have a treasury shortage. So if, if they were to buy fewer treasuries, uh, it actually probably wouldn't be the end of the world for a period of time. Uh, I think they have they have some runway to actually taper to some extent, uh, but they, they clearly want to push that as far as they can before they, they go. The other challenge, the reason I wouldn't want his job is because again, going back to the long-term debt cycle thing, when debt is this high of a percentage of GDP, you know, you, you pretty much need a, a long period of negative real rates in order to make the numbers work. And so it's kind of like you got to inflate away the debt without saying you're inflating away the debt because it's like not how long, Lynn, how when you're saying a long period of time, like what are we talking? I mean, that would depend on the speed. I mean, you know, in the 40s, you spent you spent a decade with with, you know, deeply negative real yields. Um, and then you had a couple of decades where you kind of broke even. And then you had the 70s, which was another decade of deeply negative real yields. Um, and so it partially depends on how much, how, how negative they get, right? I mean, you, it's, it's a question of both magnitude and duration. Um, and and, and they, so, but they can't, that's not a mandate. So, so they can't say that out loud. So back in the 40s, in order to fight World War II, the Fed was pretty much captured by the Treasury. They, they, they gave up any pretense of independence and were captured uh, until like 1951. Um, and so they're, they're kind of in that situation now where they were kind of like pseudo, you know, gave up independence for a period of time, monetizing debt, you know, doing everything they, they can. But they don't want to give that illusion that they're just going to inflate away the debt, have people lose, lose confidence in the currency. So they're kind of playing the narrative game where they're saying we're going to be accommodative, but no, no, we're not monetizing the deficit. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to devalue the currency significantly. And so that's a really challenging environment. So they can't say out loud, we have to hold rates, you know, zero while inflation's running hot because, you know, federal debt to GDP is 130%. That's not the part they can say out loud. So they have to say like, you know, we want to be accommodative until we have maximum employment. Uh, we think the inflation is transitory. 
So they, they have to kind of dance around the issue and it's a really challenging thing. So that's why as much as people like to blame the Fed, I, I you know, a lot of my blame is say back in the Greenspan era where they did have more levers they could pull. They could have they could have made better choices, I think. And now it's it's you know, they're they're stuck in a corner where they don't really have that many options. And so you're choosing between bad options, essentially. They definitely weren't dealing with uh, all the memes back in the 1940s. Yeah, I mean, but that's a good, the good point there. I mean, basically, inf- information travels faster now, whether yeah. in meme form or anything else. And so in the 1940s, you know, you would get a newspaper, you know. You get away with it, yeah. Yeah, you get away with things. And now it's like, you know, t- Twitter's monitoring it minute by minute. Uh, and, you know, people that d- work in like a grocery store can tell you, who the chairman of the federal reserve is and like, you know, it's not, is it this information has, has traveled far, far quicker and, and more people are aware of it. And that's, that's part of the populism that we find ourselves in now where, where everybody knows something's wrong with the financial system. There's different opinions as to what's wrong with it, different, different levels of information about what might be wrong with it, but it's kind of something that we all understand to different degrees. Uh, and, and information travels super quick. Uh, and so it's, it's really hard to keep people in the dark about what's happening. Kelly Evans had this awesome chart. You put this in your article uh, where she was showing how the personal consumption just exploded after COVID in this chart. It's an awesome chart. We'll have a link to your uh, article in the show notes where people can see this. Um, what, what do you think was actually driving this? Do you think it was a change in behavior for what they were trying to consume? Or do you think it had to do with some of the UBI checks and some of the fiscal spending that was just stuffed into the hands of of everyday Americans that was driving it? Uh, certainly both. Uh, and so basically if you're, if you're, you know, if you're told that you, you, you're locked down now, um, you know, you're going to, and like restaurants are like, you know, either closed or they're less pleasant, right. Because they're operating at half capacity and like, you know, uh, and, and travels, you know, either, especially international travel is, is a lot more frustrating now um, or in some cases blocked uh, or just harder. Uh, and so people say, okay, I'm not going to go on that international vacation. We want to, we want to have a home office. We want to have a better kitchen, right? So uh, th- th- basically, a change in in consumer preference. Um, and they might buy more electronic equipment. Um, they might do things like that. Um, and then the stimulus made it so that more people could do that, right? So if, obviously, if you if you say add zero stimulus, there'd be some some percentage of people like that wouldn't be able to make those changes and they would just be, they, you know, but they'd probably be riding in the street at that point. Right. So, uh, you know, so the stimulus checks go out, they, they allow those changes in consumer behavior to happen. Uh, but then you run into real world supply constraints. And so if you look at that chart that you're referring to, you know, our, our purchases of goods skyrocketed, whereas our purchases of services, uh, took a lot longer to recover because that's things like restaurants and travel and hotels, um, and, and, and things like that. Um, and so, especially in the United States where we specialize in services and we exported most of our goods to other countries, that, that's an issue. So that's why our trade deficit got a lot worse this year or over the past year, because, you know, we kept our demand high with stimulus checks. Um, but a lot of that just goes straight out the door to China because, you know, we're buying more from them. Uh, than they're buying from us because they're not, they're not doing as much stimulus um, and they're not kind of boosting their demand as much as we did. I, I know the the funds that are going to be part of the infrastructure deal, and it's a massive deal at this point. I think the last number I heard was 3.5 or $3.6 trillion, aren't going to hit the economy for quite a while. How do you see some of this playing into it? And does this just add more fuel to the fire for the supply chain implications that we're talking about right now, assuming that they wouldn't uh, kind of work themselves out in, in a year from now? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the stimulus bills earlier were these fast acting ones. So people got money right away. So they could either, you know, they could either put it into a home improvement. They could put it into something else. They could put it into meme stocks, Dogecoin, whatever, it, whatever they want to do. Uh, whereas infrastructure is going to be like a multi-year thing. We still don't know exactly how big it's going to be. Uh, we know it's going to be filled with pork. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it depends how useful and productive some of that ends up being. You know, if you spend money on things that are not productive, uh, then it's it would tend to be inflationary. If you spend money on things that that make things far more efficient, 
it can it can counterbalance some of that spending. And so a good example would be the, the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System, for example. That was a huge gain in productivity, even though at the time it was like the biggest public works you know project in in, in modern history. Um, and so it really kind of depends on how effective that spending is uh, and over what period of time. Now a lot of people think that you know certain materials like copper or silver or nickel are likely to you know have this constant source of demand over the next decade. Uh, due to electrification and infrastructure uh, and things like that, that are basically, you know, pro potentially propping those things up. And another component to inflation is that, you know, commodities tend to go through these big, like roughly 15 year cycles where you have a period of oversupply. So prices collapse. So nobody puts money into the space and eventually demand keeps going up over time. Uh, while there's not a lot of new supply coming online, prices go up. Uh, and so you, you, you pull more people into the space and you get oversupply again. Uh, and so the past like decade or, or, or you know, so has been a period of commodity overabundance, or at least most commodities. So we've had, we've had more oil, you know, thanks to shale that we know what to do with. A lot of it was unprofitable that they were happy, but they, you know, they let their money on fire so we could have cheap gasoline prices just unintentionally. Um, and so, you know, we had this period of commodity oversupply. Um, but now going forward, because of those those long periods of low prices, there hasn't been a lot of new supply coming online. So there's no giant new copper mines. Well, there's some, but there's not a ton coming online. Uh, and, you know, we're not investing in a lot of, say, long lived energy projects. Um, and so I think as you head out deeper into this decade, we're, we're more and more likely to have these these kind of ongoing you know, higher commodity prices, most likely, when, especially when you combine it with with currency itself losing value. Yeah, you had an awesome chart in in your uh, newsletter as well that kind of showed. I think you went back uh, back into the eighteen hundreds, right on that chart, um, showing the commodity prices in these large, like fifteen, uh, the twenty year cycles. This is another thing that I know uh, Stan Drunken Miller talks about uh, talks about with uh, long commodity bull bear cycles, and something that I know he has traded for years um, are those bigger trends, but. It's an awesome highlight in your in your article. Yeah, that was a chart from uh, it was the the, the guys from uh, Incrementum. They put out an annual. They call it the In Gold We Trust report, but it's really a giant macro report. Mm -hmm. um, and and those for the record, those guys, even though they're like gold guys in in like uh, in in Europe, they they also like Bitcoin and stuff. Um, and and so that you know that's their approach. But basically, and they included that chart from, I believe it was from Stifle. Uh, but that particular version of the chart was was formatted for their publication, um, and yeah, you basically have these these giant commodity cycles uh, that are there that occur at pretty regular intervals, uh, and obviously you know you have to monitor the details to see how far you are into that interval because they're not going to be exactly the same. It's going to depend on you know just different ch human choices along the way, uh, but you know most evidence shows that we've been through this pretty long period of commodity oversupply, and for many types of commodities now we're in. Or at least we're looking at the, a pretty good potential for, you know, more supply constraint uh, and and tighter, you know, supply demand spreads. All right, Amazon versus Alibaba, and the reason I bring this up is because I know in your uh, model portfolio that you have, I I don't think I see Amazon in there. Um, I know that you have a position or you're recommending a position in Alibaba, and. The, the reason I'm questioning this or bringing this up is because of all the concerns with having Chinese equities at this point, especially with some of the actions that they've been taking. I know some folks are even going as far as, as saying, hey, this is their big chance if they, if they want to take action on Taiwan. Um, this is kind of the prime time to do it with everything that's happening with the U.S. and Afghanistan and the fact that they've already uh, done something similar with uh, Hong Kong. So I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that and just kind of analyzing the difference between those two. Yeah. So I, I actually do have Amazon in the portfolio, but not uh, that is one of the FANG stocks I do like uh, pretty much. Uh, whereas there are other FANG stocks that I avoid at the current time. So Amazon is one of the ones I do like. For, for China, I do have uh, a position in Alibaba uh, and JD as well. Uh, my view with them is that Right now, they're they're basically so beaten down in terms of valuation and sentiment uh, that they make for an interesting kind of contrarian play. Uh, and especially, I mean, some of them like JD. JD is a pretty well-run company, for example. They they specialize in logistics infrastructure. Um, and so 
they've been, you know, kind of attacked by their kind of more authoritarian governance approach where they wanted to shape society in a certain direction. So they go after those. And there are a lot of concerns that, you know, the United States might go after some of our tech companies in a similar way. I mean, you could argue that some of them have achieved monopoly like like aspects. And so if you look at China, for example, some of the actions they took against them were justified in the sense that, you know, you had say like one giant platform say you can if, if a vendor you know uses a competitor they can't use our platform kind of these anti-competitive practices so china wanted to cut down on those which i think was fair uh but then of course because it's china they they went authoritarian they went human rights issues they 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 went way too far in other directions so one of the issues i think is that it is good to have international exposure at this time but I, I think it's certainly fair to leave out countries that you just don't, you don't want to invest in. So I think it's fully fair to someone to say, you know what, I want to have zero China's equity exposure. Uh, I don't want to deal with that risk at all. I don't want it to take any thought space uh, from me. Uh, and I think that's a fully fair conclusion as well. Um, and this, the, the counterpoint would be to say, you know, you can have a small position uh, in something that is very kind of beaten down and low sentiment, uh, and it can do very well as a somewhat uncorrelated investment. So if you look over the past year, Chinese stocks and American stocks have been quite uncorrelated with Chinese stocks performing poorly, American stocks performing very well. And you could easily have a period of time where that that flips around. Uh, and so it depends on what type of portfolio you want to have. Uh, but overall, you know, there, there's different types of exposures that someone can have. What are your thoughts on the concern of Amazon right now, considering so much of their products are sourced from China with all the supply chain impacts that we were talking about earlier? Um does this mean that it could be kind of a, a rough couple quarters ahead based on based on some of those things? It'll partially come down to how much they can they can, you know, price pass those prices on to consumers. And so with Amazon, you have it's kind of a hybrid business because you have what you think of as the retail business, and they also have the cloud computing business, which is actually where a lot of their margins come come from. So it's funny if you look at a lot of e-commerce companies, a lot of them aren't very profitable. Um, uh, but because Amazon's had that hybrid model that that's served them very well. Um, and so uh, certainly Amazon has risks to it. Um, and so yeah, I don't, I'm not like overweight Amazon. I just have a, you know, a pretty small position in Amazon. Uh, but I do think that, you know, we're still having a, a basically a structural period of e-commerce gaining over physical commerce uh, at the same time as cloud computing is still gaining market share as well. And so overall, I think, you know, Basically, Amazon's been in this like more than a year long price consolidation uh, for a while. Um, and so actually, the, as expensive as Amazon is, they're actually relatively inexpensive compared to their 20 year average. They're, they're kind of like moderately below average. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see another leg up uh, in their in their price overall. Uh, at the same time, you know, they haven't done financialization the way that say Apple has. So for I like to describe it as like a rocket ship going to space. They let off the first boosters and then they continue with like another another thrusters as they go further up. And so if you look at something like Apple, they had this huge period of growth, massive growth with the iPhone and everything. They built up a ton of cash. Uh, and then they said, okay, now we're gonna start financializing. So now we're gonna issue debt. We're gonna buy back our shares. We're gonna pay a dividend. Uh, and so they, they, they got that second leg of growth. If you look at their revenue, it actually hasn't been growing very much at all, but they, they really optimized that per share uh, aspect. Whereas yeah. there, are other, there are other giant companies like Facebook and Amazon that have not pulled that, that second lever yet. They haven't financialized yet. They're still in like the rapid growth phase. Um, and so I think that they still have that lever ahead of them to pull. Uh, and so it'll be interesting. But the, the big risk is that you could have changing politics in the United States where everybody's overweight the S&P 500, including international investors. Everybody's, everybody's piled into, into U.S. markets. Uh, and then we have a change of pace and we decide, okay, we're going to raise corporate tax rates or we're going to go after Amazon and Facebook uh, and, and Apple more so than more so than we have before, maybe not to the extent of China, but you know, maybe more than the slap on the wrist that we've done in the past. So everybody gets piled in and then that's when, you know, you kind of, you know, go after them. Uh, and so that's kind of the risk of everybody on one side of the boat at the same time. All right. So uh, I know you've been a critic of Ethereum. I'm obviously a critic of Ethereum, so I don't know how balanced of a conversation we're going to have here. But um, they recently did their 1559 uh, change in monetary policy. What are your thoughts on 
on what's happening with Ethereum right now? Has your thesis changed? Uh, has it stayed the same? I'm just kind of curious where you're at. Yeah, it's not really it's not really changed. The funny thing is, so in my in my premium research service, uh, you know, I've been I kind of separate price action from what I actually think of the fundamentals. Yeah. So I mean, I've been saying since January, like I was like, okay, once this breaks above like fourteen hundred, like the previous highs this thing could run. I mean, it's, you know, when when Bitcoin has a bull market, some of these other things can go up even more. So I'm saying like, you know, I was actually pretty tactically bullish on Ethereum, despite every time I say that, I'm like, but it's, you're dealing with a very different set of technical reliability yeah. here. Um, and, and you know, then you're, then you, when you look at something like Bitcoin. Uh, and so it's like, I do that in order to preserve ob objectivity, right? If I just didn't cover Ethereum at all, it's like, well, you're clearly just kind of putting your blinders on and only covering the chain you like. So I say, okay, I, Ethereum is big enough. I'll certainly cover it. Um, and just like my view on price action for a period of time, it can be quite different than my view of the fundamentals. So I've been saying like, it's, you know, they, they've constructed a, a supply squeeze that is pretty well engineered. Uh, and so on one hand, you launch Ethereum 2.0 staking. So it's one way staking. Uh, you don't, we don't know when Ethereum 2 is going to be launched. I mean, they, they've changed the dates a number of times. Um, and so you're, you have this one way lockup period. It's kind of like the grayscale trust that, that Bitcoin was going through. So you have this one way lockup period. Uh, then you do EIP 1559, where you, uh, you know, you're burning Ethereum now. Uh, and so they like to call it ultrasound monetary policy. Um, but that only, it's the fact that you've, you've, you now have a, a less inflationary protocol. But the mere fact that you could change the monetary policy is different than if you just can't change the monetary policy at all, right? So it's the, someone later could change it back potentially. Uh, and so they're in that environment now where you, as long as that's in place, you're kind of creating a supply squeeze. And so kind of like how you have Bitcoin going off exchanges, you have Ethereum going off exchanges. And so you have a pretty you know, powerful price mechanism. Um, but you know, I think the long-term longevity of that is more in question than the one for Bitcoin. And, and as, as an example, Ethereum just had another unintended chain split and, and the price just didn't care, right? Because security is just not like the number one priority of that protocol in the way that it is for Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin makes these very slow, deliberative consensus changes. Uh, we can take all the time in the world because we don't, we don't put difficulty bombs in the, in the chain, uh, whereas Ethereum has these difficulty bombs that kind of give the developers you know, kind of an upper hand uh, in terms of, of putting changes through so they can fork to new chains and, and, the, and the, the community kind of shifts over to them pretty readily. Uh, another big challenge I think about Ethereum is that a lot of it's built on decentralized finance, but it has these kind of big centralized points to it where you feel like you're decentralized, but at the end of the day, you're not really resilient to state attacks. It's actually a good analogy is the supply chain issues we talked about earlier you know, we got prices pretty low by sacrificing resiliency to, you know, globalize our supply chains, arbitrage everything we could. Yeah. And, yeah. and so now they're saying prices are only higher because of supply chain issues. It's like, well, they're only low in the first place because we sacrificed resiliency. So now we're getting, now we're paying some of the price for that. And so, you know, if you, if you sacrifice decentralization to do something that is kind of neat and fun and, and you know, uh, that can work for a period of time. But you never know when you're going to be exposed to an attack. Maybe Gary Gensler wants to crack down on you. Maybe, you know, just different state actors want to go after you. You're not really set up for that type of kind of resilience. You know, you don't, you don't really have that like Hydra honey badger like, aspect that, say, Bitcoin has. So in addition, we're seeing, you know, smart contracts can migrate to other smart contract chains, right? So you saw, for example, Tether used to run on, on Bitcoin. Uh, on the Omni layer, and then it, then it switched over to Ethereum, which was you know more suitable for it. And then when Ethereum got expensive, it shifted over to Tron uh, in many cases. Um, and, and so now we're seeing interest in Solana, for example. Um, and so they can shift to more and more centralized you know blockchains that that make you know they sacrifice decentralization to be more efficient. Uh, but then they're they don't they don't they don't make the full use of the blockchain because they're not decentralized, which is kind of the whole point of a blockchain. Do you find that the protocols that have an underlying token that is more inflationary, uh, that that will attract uh, more utility onto the uh, for the use of smart contracts? So if you're uh, looking at Ethereum and it's got this ultrasound, quote unquote, uh, ultrasound token to it, 
are they disincentivizing the people that would be using it for smart contracts um, because of the the token is becoming more and more valuable? And so uh, uh, Nick Carter's argument, I think this is his argument as far as whatever working capital you're using in order to service that that smart contract, it's it's not something that you actually want to use. Almost like a if we were going to apply it to like fiat currency. Um, when we debase the currency here in the U.S., it has it attracts other foreign currencies into the country in order to be used to consume goods and services. Is that something that we would see on on the protocol layer? Yeah, there's a couple layers to this. So, I, you know, one of the well formulated arguments goes back to 2017 from John Pfeffer. Uh, he mm-hmm. wrote that paper, yes. like the institutional investors' case for Bitcoin or or something like that. I forget the exact title, and he basically made the argument that you know, smart contract protocols are more like, say, copper or oil. They're more like working capital, or, or you know, it's a casino where you 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 use those chips when you're there, but then you cash out. You don't want to, you don't leave your, you don't store your value in casino chips, right? You get out when you're done playing in the casino, and you store it in something, you know, more universal. This this money, and that it's really hard for a platform to monetize to be to optimize to be both money and efficient smart contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Ethereum's got so much going on in the base layer, uh, and you know, so it's more complex, more prone to being buggy, like we've seen with the unintended chain split, um, and just you know, more issues going on there in order to do more in the base layer. Um, and the problem is, so they're sacrificing some degree of decentralization to do more things. But then if another chain comes along and says we're going to sacrifice even a little bit more decentralization to be even more efficient. Uh, things can migrate over there. So partially it can come down to how inflationary the, the monetary policy is, right? So that could, you know, they want to keep those those transaction fees low, but it also comes down to how centralized the nodes are. Um, and so for example, Solana is getting attention because of how high its transaction throughput is. Um, but if you look at the node requirements, they're super high. You need like a data center to run one of those, right? So the, the bandwidth requirements are like insane. The, the you know, the CPU requirements, um, and so it's not just about inflation versus deflation that affects how efficient a smart contract program is. It's also about how hard it is to run a node and any, any sort of like sacrifices you're willing to make to have this more like enterprise grade thing that is say higher transaction throughput uh, and therefore lower fees, better usability for the person who wants to trade stable coins or, you know, DeFi or whatever they want to do. Um, but then you sacrifice auditability and the ability to run your own node, kind of the whole you know block war size in Bitcoin that we know how that resolved. So some of those are basically making the opposite decision and saying, we're gonna make a node even harder to run than Ethereum. Um, and we're gonna have say more transaction throughput. Uh, and so we're seeing that kind of play out. So they, they have a couple of different levels they can, they can pull if they wanna increase efficiency, but every one of those levers comes with trade-offs. Um, and so with EIP 1559, I've seen some good analysis that showed that essentially what they did, if you look at transaction fees before and after, it cut out a lot of the lowest cost transactions, right? So it's kind of like you eliminated the really cheap ones. Um, and so overall, it has kind of increased transaction fees, but it's, we've also had you know NFTs and other things like that, increased chain usage that also contributed to transaction fees going up. And so generally, we've seen a tendency where over time, things will migrate to whatever chain is, is cheaper. So Ethereum does have some degree of a network effect, uh, but it also has these cheaper competitors that came later. Uh, and so it, it'd be interesting to see how that, that space plays out. I, I essentially view them all of them as equities. There are, there are all these different equities and they're mostly kind of focusing on speculation. So it's kind of like a bunch of casino stocks essentially where, you know, one, one you know, you have Bitcoin on one hand, that's actual money. It's, it's got this credible decentralized auditable you know, process with that optimized security above everything else. And then you have a bunch of these other equities that are kind of like these somewhat decentralized, somewhat centralized operating system that mostly folks around, you know, lending, leveraging, trading other tokens that themselves are often these, these other types of platforms to do the same thing. Uh, and then now speculation on, on art essentially. So it's, it's, they're very speculation based and they have a lot of the qualities of equities rather than money. Gary Ginsler just gave himself a high five listening to you. 
Well, I mean, if you, uh, he, the, the SEC does have that, you know, they have that general guideline for what constitutes a security, and you know, you you, you issue, there. yeah, you you issue tokens ahead of time, uh, and then you have some sort of centralized team that is going to work to increase the value of those tokens, um, and, and so that's what a lot of those models look like. Um, Especially where, when you get into the staking, that's paying interest. Yeah, and and also yeah. I mean, proof of proof of stake in general. So if you look at how corporations work, they work on proof of stake. Uh, and that's that's a good thing for corporations, right? So if you're if you're the founder of the company and you control 51% of the stock, you should have more more say in the company than someone who bought one share, for example. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you were organizing how you do voting, you know, if you if you if you got more votes based on how much money you'd have, you know, then Jeff Bezos would have like a million times more votes than a school teacher. Um, and we would quickly become an like an oligopoly. Right, so you'd have a handful of people that can dictate policy, and so that's not good for democracies or money, even though it's good for equities, um, because equities are these optional things that you can choose to participate in if you want to, or you can go to another one. Uh, whereas money is something that's more universal, or or voting, it's more universal, and so proof of stake is generally not how we organize things uh, in, in those fields. How do you see a lot of the policy playing out in the coming year or two? Do you see the SEC stepping in and and really kind of exercising and working with Congress in order to get like the buyer bill, the the draft buyer bill pushed through? Or do you see this as being something that's going to be extraordinarily hard for the SEC to do anything at this point? There are certainly people that are closer to the regulators that might have more insight. Uh, I mean, he's pretty much said that he would need more budget to really go after this. Um, and so it almost seems like they want to outsource that to the exchanges and basically put it more on them to restrict mm. the types of, of tokens they let on their platform. Mm. Um, so it's kind of like, if you're not sure something is an unregistered security, it, it probably is. Um, and, you know, we'll see if they get budget increases and we'll see if they kind of, you know, start doing some shock and all and go after some of these platforms that, it, that they think are the most egregious. Um, or if they just kind of grandfather certain things in and let things, you know, kind of keep going as they are. And they're, they're kind of attacking multiple fronts. I mean, one thing, you know, they, they're responsible for, say, approving a Bitcoin ETF uh, in a certain form. They're also, uh, you know, we, we've seen Gary Gensler talk about payment for order flow, like what Robinhood does, for example. Yeah, that's, yeah. Unrelate, that's unrelated. Uh, and then there's the question of what, what tokens they want to go after. Um, so they, they have multiple battles on multiple fronts and they only have so many people but you know there there are people that understand the inner workings of the sec far more than than i do lynn what are your thoughts on uh the borrowing and lending in this space um you're seeing a lot of the exchanges now offering interest rates for either staking or like if you have your bitcoin you make a deposit um what are your thoughts about the risks associated with some of this, this custody and this rehypothecation risk? Um, and is it worth it? Or is this something that you just avoid altogether? What are your thoughts on it? Well, so I minimize my exposure to it. I, I, I put a small percentage of my Bitcoin into BlockFi a while ago. Uh, mm-hmm. It was basically an amount that, it, you know, it's partially it's because I wanted to explore the ecosystem. Right. So yeah. I wanted to see the ecosystem being built around it. So I, I talked to the CEO to discuss their risk and everything. I talked, you know, I, I talked to, to one of their VCs. Um, and so I, I eventually put a small amount in uh, that was not, you know, just a, a small percentage of my stack. Um, and but as interest rates have come down, that's obviously become less attractive. Now you're kind of yeah. taking on 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 risk without you know reward. Um, and then staking on exchanges is kind of a different story because that's another centralization risk, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, running, say, an Ethereum validator, assuming Ethereum 2 goes through, uh, is, is a pretty expensive ordeal, right, to run a validator. Um, and so yeah, a lot of people would rather, like, you know, outsource that to an exchange. What if um, it never goes through? Well, then, yeah. Well, then that that's a whole other can of worms. But even say yeah. it goes through, or even take, yeah. say, another, another proof-of-stake protocol that's already gone through, uh, people yeah. are already staking it on exchanges, so you're, the, the custodian is the one that really has the power there, right? It's kind of like how Vanguard and BlackRock can vote on behalf of their trillions and trillions of dollars worth of shares for their, for their passive owners, right? Yes, so yes. it's like, so the, if you go back to say the Bitcoin block war, we saw that, you know, when we were talking about how big they wanted to change that block size to, 
you had like 80% of the mining hash rate in favor of a block size increase. You had major exchanges in favor of it. Um, and they still couldn't get it through because they, they couldn't compete with the node network, right? So the, the user node network was decentralized enough that even, even the big quorum of, of large companies in the space couldn't get that through. Whereas if, if, if Bitcoin was a proof of stake system back then, and all those big custodians and exchanges said, no, we want this change to go through. Uh, and, and you know we're the ones that hold the, the validators or most of them. So we're gonna go ahead and vote to you know do this. Um, and, and so it, you know, it risks centralizing the system in a similar way that our, our current system has become rather centralized where you have a handful of billionaires that are super well connected and, and you know, can, can contribute just massive amounts of money to political campaigns and financialize that whole thing. It's kind of like if you could buy votes. Um, and so proof of stake, I just inherently view as, as equity-like uh, and, and prone to centralization which again is only good for a system that you can say opt into or opt out of compared to something that like say Bitcoin uh, is trying to you know, make a reasonable shot for being like global money um, where you don't want, you, know, you want to minimize centralization risk as much as you possibly can with a project that has that level of ambition. So Lynn, I don't have any other questions for you. I know we, we could probably talk for the rest of the, the night here, but um, I just want people to know um, how much I love your newsletter. Um, anytime I ask you to come on, you're just so so generous to come on with your time. But uh, I'm a huge fan. And anything that you publish, I read um, with a highlighter. Um, I print it off. I'm holding here. Like anything that Lynn does, I immediately print it. Um, and go through it because you're just so thoughtful on so many different areas. And one of the things that I, that I like about your newsletter, um, is you actually go in there and you, and you call out individual companies. You have various types of portfolios that you're providing to people that, you know, pay and subscribe to your service. But, um, it is just, it's so beneficial for me to see what you're looking at, because I know your depth of knowledge and the, and your filtering, of everything that's out there is unprecedented. So I just want people to know your newsletter is amazing. Um, I can't promote that enough. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, is there anything that you want to highlight, uh, maybe your Twitter profile or whatever, so that people uh, may be listening to you for the first time and they want to learn more about you, they can find you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So people can find the bulk of my work at lindalden.com. Uh, that's why I have, a, I have a free newsletter that comes out every six weeks. I have public articles. I have, I have a low cost research service. And then at Twitter, I'm at Lynn Alden Contact. And so people know me from different areas. So I, I cover Bitcoin a lot, uh, but I also cover other asset classes and, and macro in general uh, because we are in such interesting times, right? So, I, you know, the long term debt cycle, the fourth turning, whatever you want to call it, we're going through some pretty interesting changes at this current time. Uh, and so I, I at least do my best to try to explain what's happening, explain, you know, what I think things mean. And it's always probability based. So you can't predict the future, but you're saying, okay, so this set of, this sector looks very expensive or this, this policy change has the risk of this happening. And then we kind of monitor that over time and see which things played out, which things maybe went in a different direction and why. And people say they find it useful because, you know, this, it's just a very complex environment that we're in. And, and if I just could piggyback off of what you're saying, you're exactly right. You're never saying this is going to play out. What you're doing is you're, you're showing this array of potential outcomes and not just in one sector. I mean, the breadth of what you're covering is, is mind blowing in these, in these write-ups that you're doing. And you're saying, Hey, this is what I kind of think is the most probable, but this is the other, this is the other side of the story. And it provides, it just arms me personally with so much just knowledge. I just love it. But um, anyway, thanks so much for coming on the show. I love doing this and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it again in the near future. Happy to. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.